Okay, we're here in section 4.3 where we're talking about forms and graphs of quadratic functions. And quadratic functions are these awesome functions that we have to have an x squared term in them um, to know that it's a quadratic function. That's what makes them different than linear functions, but no higher power than a squared term. And um, we've seen the standard form of a quadratic function, that y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, but I want us to think of an analogy for a minute. Just like with a paper doll set, here's Rapunzel, and you could put different outfits on her and try different clothes on her, but essentially, at the end of the day, underneath those clothes, it's still Rapunzel, right? I mean, so for a quadratic function, you can have them looking different, you can have different forms of them, but underneath, it's still the same function. It's still this quadratic function. It may be just written differently with sort of a different dressing on it, but it's still a quadratic function. And I want to give you an analogy with um, linear functions. So just like with, um, we're going to see different forms of quadratic functions, we're, we've already seen different forms of linear functions. So for example, when we were looking at linear functions, you could have something like 2x plus 3y equals 7, and that's definitely a linear function. It's a line, and that's a linear function in standard form, actually. There's no powers on the variables, but you could also have a linear function that looks like y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 7 thirds. And this was called slope-intercept form of a linear function. Um, but these two forms are actually describing the same line. So underneath um, this standard form and the slope-intercept form, they're describing the same line, they're just written differently. This one highlights the slope and the intercept, and it's a good form because we can read off um, right away what the slope and the intercept were. So we've got this standard form and the slope-intercept forms of lines. Just like Rapunzel, it's just different dresses, different out, you know, different ways of looking at it, but essentially it's the same line. If you graphed both of those, you would see that it was the same line. So just like with linear functions, that happens with quadratic functions too. Sometimes we want different forms of quadratic functions depending on what we kind of want to look for. This, this was the standard form, and the A, B, and C here all represented different things. The C was our y-intercept, the B was the rate of change right at the <clears throat> um, right at the initial value, and A was telling us if the parabola is opening up or opening down, depending on if it was positive or negative. And so this is the standard form of a quadratic function. So one thing we need to talk about with a quadratic function is what the vertex is. The vertex is a really important point on a quadratic function. It's the point where it turns around. So it's either the lowest point or the highest point of the parabola. And you can picture um, in your mind what that is. Here they are. So here in this parabola, we have a lowest point, and maybe it's something like 4, 2. And here in this other parabola, we have um, not a lowest point, but we have a highest point. And maybe it's something like negative 3, 5. Every parabola will have one, and this is the vertex. It'd be nice if we had a form for quadratic functions that sort of highlighted the vertex. <coughs> As you're approaching the vertex, um, on this parabola you can see we've got these negative slopes, a really high negative slope over here, kind of steeply negative, then less steeply, then less steeply, and then it turns into a positive slope as soon as we're past the vertex. Um, and actually at the vertex, the slope of the function will be zero. This is true of any vertex. Um, in a parabola, in a quadratic function, that the slope, that instantaneous rate of change right at the vertex is equal to zero. So it doesn't matter if your um, parabola is opening up or opening down. In this parabola here, we have some really, first of all, we start with some positive slopes. And as we approach the vertex, um, as soon as we pass it, the slope turns negative for the function. And there it's kind of, um, a little bit negative, then more negative, then even more negative, then even more steeply negative over here. But right at the vertex, our instantaneous rate of change, that slope 
um, right at that moment is zero. So that's a big deal that the, the, the rate of change of the function at the vertex will be zero. That's a fact that we definitely want to remember, that we want to keep in mind. The rate of change at the vertex will equal zero. True of any quadratic function, and every quadratic function has a vertex, so this will always happen. Um, all quadratic functions are these parabola shapes, and wherever that vertex is, the rate of change of the function will be zero. That's an important topic in calculus later on. Um, when we're trying to optimize some functions. So that's a that's a fact that we want to store away and remember in our brain. Okay. So our goal is we want a form for a quadratic equation. So we have these quadratic equations and we want a certain form. Um, we know we can get different forms of them and the form that we want is one that will highlight the vertex. So a, a form of the equation of the quadratic function where we can easily read off the vertex. Um, remember that we've, you know, this is standard form of a quadratic equation. We want one that's different, just like sometimes we have standard form of a linear equation, but then we also have slope intercept form and the slope intercept form highlights really quickly for us what the slope and the intercept of that function are. Um, sometimes we want the standard form of a quadratic function, but sometimes we want a different form that will highlight for us what the vertex is because that's such an important part of a quadratic function. So I want to look for a minute at the most basic type of quadratic function and that would be y equals x squared. This is like the, you know, base model quadratic function. You're um, the, the one that is the starting point for all other quadratic functions. And um, I want to look at where's the vertex of this function. And the vertex, this lowest point here, is the point 0, 0. Okay, so what happens if I um, say that I wanted to take this function and shift it to the right five units? What would the equation for that function look like? That, let's see, if I want to shift right five units, I don't add five, I subtract five. These are, this is back in the days of our linear transformations. Um, that this function here, which is another quadratic function, will give us the original function shifted right five units. Say I wanted to go one more step and I wanted to um, not only shift it right five units, but shift it up two units. So that would be y equals x minus five. That's going to take care of the shift right five units. And then to shift it up two units, should I add or subtract two to all of that? Probably add two. And there it is. So with this first function, the vertex was at zero, zero. Then with my purple guy, um, when I shifted it right five, the vertex moved to five, zero, and, and that's something we should have expected uh, because that point zero, zero moved to five, zero. And then when I shifted it up two units, the vertex for that function became five, two. So let's record some of what we learned down in this table. When I had y equals x squared, this basic quadratic function, then the vertex was at the point 0, 0. That's what, that's where um, my vertex was. When I had the equation y equals x minus 5 squared, then the vertex um, got moved, it got shifted right 5, so then the vertex was at the point 5, 0. And then we saw when um, the vertex was, or when the quadratic function was y equals x minus 5 squared plus 2, that the vertex moved to 5, 2. This was all pretty predictable because of what we know about uh, uh, function transformations. This would move everything right 5, that did. This would move things right 5 and up 2, and it did. So knowing what we know about those three examples, where would we expect the vertex to be for this guy? y equals x minus h squared plus k. Well, looking back and seeing how things happened before, we would probably expect the vertex to be have an x-coordinate of h and have a y-coordinate of k. So we would expect the vertex to be at hk. 
Okay, so that's a good start for where we want to go. Um, let's go back and look at a few more variations of quadratic functions. So this time, instead of looking at y equals x squared, let's go back and let's look at y equals 2x squared. Okay, so this guy looks somewhat similar to y equals x squared. It's a little bit narrow, a little bit skinnier, but the vertex is still at 0, 0. What if we did y equals 3x squared? Okay, even skinnier, but the vertex still stays put. Um, how about y equals 5x squared? So it turns out it doesn't matter what this number is in front of the x squared. Um, the vertex is going to be at 0, 0. We could even take y equals ax squared. And we could, let's take these guys off. Um, not this guy. And we could move that a around. We could make it a equals 3.2. You know, a, so y equals 5x squared. y equals 7.4x squared. And the vertex, it looks like, stays put at 0, 0. Even if we go negative, the vertex still is at 0, 0 for this function here. So all we're doing is kind of changing dynamically this, this number a. And whatever it is, if all we have is x squared, the vertex stays put at 0, 0. So that's the first thing we want to remember, is that this a actually doesn't affect where the vertex is at all. So let's make the quadratic function a little more interesting. Let's say y equals 2 times x minus 4, oops, 4 squared plus 6. Now we've got a lot going on. We still have the two hanging around, um, but now we have a four that looks like, and it's a minus four, so that looks like it should be a shift right, and then a plus six, which is a shift up. So we're gonna take this function and we're gonna shift it right four units and up six units. What about this two though in front? You know, with this function, once we graph it, where would we expect the vertex to be? Should we expect it to be at four, six, or would it be at something like eight? 6 or even you know maybe this is 16 maybe it would be at 32 6 or 8 12 who knows um where will it end up so let's graph it okay so the vertex for this function ends up at 4 6 this 2 had no effect on um where the vertex would be it just all depended on this number and this number here all right, let's go back and fill in some of that extra info that we now know. We saw that when y equals 2x squared, that the vertex was actually still at 0, 0. The 2 didn't affect where the vertex was. And then importantly, we saw that when y equals 2 times x minus 4 squared plus 6, that the vertex was actually just at 4, 6, that the 2 there didn't affect things. So this is a good example to see, um, you know, with other things going on, the vertex still just relied on these two numbers here. So let's change this slightly, this little piece down here. And what if we say, okay, um, say that we have a number a in front. Is that still okay? Yeah, actually, even with this little a guy in front here, um, the vertex for this function, this quadratic function, is hk. And this is vertex form for a quadratic function right here. Just as with a linear function, the form y equals mx plus b is such an important form, this one is a really helpful form also. And I want to zoom in for a minute and um, really look at it, especially this little guy here. This little two gets forgotten so often. Do not forget that this has to be there. This is an important part of this form. And unfortunately, a lot of times students leave this off just as they're working through a problem and they'll get the answer wrong. This two is an important part of this whole form. Um, it, it's the thing that signals that we're talking about a quadratic function. But um, the other important parts are this h and k. These guys will read off the vertex for us, 
And this A does not affect the vertex. Still, the this is still the A actually from standard, the standard form of the quadratic equation. And he just really right now tells us whether the parabola opens up or down. Okay, let's get some practice with this vertex form. And we're gonna sketch the graphs of the following functions. Our first one is f of x equals three x minus two squared minus one. So first we wanna make a note of where the vertex is. And in this function, the vertex will be at two, negative one. And the, the other thing that we can easily read off is, does this function open up or down? This is a positive number out here, so it'll open up. That's enough information to give us a good sketch. So let's see, two, one, it'll be one, two, down one. Here's the vertex. And we know that it's opening up. So something roughly like this is what this quadratic function will look like. Okay, let's graph this one. We've got f of x equals 2 thirds x plus 3 squared plus 5. So this time the vertex will be at, hmm, okay, where will the vertex be at? We've got this guy. Is it going to be, is the x-coordinate going to be 3 or negative 3? Well, the form really is, does say that we have to have a minus h here, and we've got a plus here. So this is really transferring or er, transforming the vertex left three. You know, you remember back here, was it zero, zero? So the vertex will be at negative three, five. It's always the opposite of whatever number is um, with the x in here. So the vertex here will be negative three, five. And that follows from um, the, the way that these transformations work. Okay, what about this two-thirds guy? Uh, what's it doing? And will this open up or down or be kind of flattish? This is a positive number, so it definitely opens up. So it looks like we're going to be going one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. Here's the vertex, and I know I'm opening up somehow into a parabola. So this is how this guy is roughly going to be sketched. So here are two forms for quadratic functions. Standard form is the first type we saw. And then now we've been talking about this other form, vertex form. So a question that comes up is, if we're giving given a quadratic function in standard form, how could we tell algebraically what the vertex would be? So say, for example, that we're asked to find the vertex of this quadratic function. And this is a quadratic function that is in standard form. And so we can't just read off the vertex like as if it were in vertex for form. So let's pause on this example for a minute and go back to vertex form and develop a little bit of theory. So what if I actually took a quadratic function that's written in vertex form and rewrote it in standard form? then I would get something like y equals a, let's see, x minus h squared, that'll end up being x minus h times x minus h, that's x squared minus 2xh plus h squared. So all of this, once you square it out, you have to think of two binomials being multiplied together, ends up being this. plus k. And then cleaning that up a little bit, we get y equals ax squared. We'll just distribute the a through minus 2ahx plus a times h squared plus k, which looks like a bit of a mess, but if it actually is in standard form at this point. We have an x squared term, an x term, and then a constant term. The constant term is all these guys here. There's no x's in here, so it's a constant term. And this right here, if you think of standard form, this a is the a of standard form. All of this right here would represent the b in standard form. And then all of this here is the c from standard form, the constant. So importantly, 
these two things are the same. The b from the standard form is the same thing as negative 2ah. So hidden inside of this b from standard form is an expression that has an h in it. An h is the x-coordinate of our vertex. So the x-coordinate of our vertex is actually kind of hidden inside of this term. We just have to unpack it a little bit and peel off some of the other stuff. So we can say that b equals negative 2ah. And that's true because this b from standard form is the coefficient of the x term. And that in this, in this case, when we had it in vertex form before, it was minus 2ah. And if b equals negative 2ah, then let's divide both sides by negative 2a. goes away over here. And so we get that h equals b over negative 2a or negative b over 2a. This is an important result because um, right here in this expression, we're relating the h from vertex form to the b and a in standard form. So what this gives us the ability to do is if we have a, a quadratic function in standard form, just knowing the a and the b can tell us the h, so the x-coordinate of the vertex. Let's see how knowing this is helpful in this problem. Okay, they, we're asked to find the vertex of this, and we can't see it right off because it's not in vertex form, but we could say that I know that the x-coordinate of the vertex will be um, negative b over 2a, which in this case is negative negative 6, that's the b, over 2 times a, and a here is 1, so this is 6 over 2, which is 3. Okay, that's great. I've got the x-coordinate of the vertex. If I know the x-coordinate of the vertex, I can put um, the value in as an input into my function and find the y value of, of the vertex. So 3 is definitely the x-coordinate of the vertex, and then I'll just put it into the function. And that should be 3 squared minus 6 times 3 plus 27. And that simplifies to 9 minus 18 plus 27. This is a negative 9 plus 27. And that sounds like 18. Here's my y-coordinate of my vertex. And so we can say that the vertex is at 318 if our quadratic function is this. We do need to talk about the idea of horizontal intercepts for these parabolas. Sometimes we're given a quadratic function and it's helpful to know where it hits the horizontal axis. And anytime we want to find an intercept, whether it's the x-intercept or the y-intercept, we set the other variable equal to zero. So if we want to find the x-intercepts, we're going to set the y, we're going to set y equal to zero and solve that equation. Now honestly, you can often do this graphically just by going on Desmos, and Desmos will give you the x-intercepts just by clicking on them. But we do want to know how to do it algebraically because there may be situations where we, you know, um, there's certain parameters that we can't graph it, but we want to still solve for the x-intercepts. So we do want to, to touch on how we would solve, how we would find these algebraically. In this example, we're going to find the x-intercepts of f of x equals x squared minus 4x plus 3. Definitely a quadratic function here. So it's some sort of parabola that's probably going to hit the x-axis two times, and we want to find those two times. So we start by setting y equal to 0. In this case, there's no y in the equation, but f of x acts like a y. So we get 0 equals x squared minus 4x plus 3. And how would we solve this? We can't just isolate the x. Um, we are going to try to factor this first, this right side, and we first try to factor it as two binomials. So as we factor, we know that we want this and this to multiply to x squared 
So we would have x and x here. And then for these numbers, we need some numbers that will multiply to 3 and add up to negative 4. And I think the two numbers that we want are negative 3 and negative 1. That should work. Um, we'll get x squared minus x minus a 3x. So that's our minus 4x. And then we'll get a plus 3. So that's awesome. That, that's the factoring that works. And then we can solve it from here by setting each factor equal to 0. So either x minus 3 equals 0 or x minus 1 equals 0. We know that one of them has to be 0 because they're being multiplied and creating a 0. That only happens if one of the factors is 0. So either x equals 3 or x equals 1. These are our two x-intercepts. So this function here will be going through 3, 0, and 1, 0. So here's 1, 0 right here, and here's 3, 0 right here. Because this is a positive number, this one, this implied 1 right here, I know that it's opening upwards. So this quadratic function is going to look something like this. There is a really quick graphical way to find the horizontal intercepts of our of a quadratic function here. Um, say we're giving some random quadratic function, and this one is pretty tough to factor. You can't just factor it in your head, actually. But on Desmos, it's really nice. They'll give you the horizontal intercept. So even if I just click on it, um, oh, it looks like maybe this one isn't too hard to factor, actually. But um, yeah, just clicking on the horizontal intercepts, Desmos will give you the coordinates. And here it's giving me the coordinates for the vertex. And also one other thing, what's this point here? It's going to give me the y-intercept um, coordinate. So Desmos is really awesome, powerful. Um, say that this was, uh, let's see, plus 8. Okay, so this, th say this was our quadratic function. First of all, where is it? Um, it's up here. This is a quadratic function that has no x-intercepts. So sometimes that happens, that a quadratic function just turns around even before it hits the x-axis, or maybe it's down here. Um, so it is possible for a quadratic function to not have to never hit the x-axis, to not have x-intercepts. It'll always have a y-intercept for sure, and it'll always have a vertex, but it is possible for a quadratic function to not have x-intercepts. We have the following application, which is going to use a quadratic function. So let's take a look at it. A square is to be cut out of the middle of an 18 by 18 inch matting board to make a frame. The mat frame will be placed over a square picture Okay, so we've got some picture inside and should overlap the picture by one inch on each side. That's what all of this is. It's a one inch overlap here as shown in the figure. And then the question for us is, what will be the mat frame area for an X inch by X inch picture? So let's see, the mat frame area will be the area of all of this here, even though the picture's overlapping it a little bit. So A, which is the mat frame area, will be, let's see, we've got, um, if there was no hole cut out, like if it was just a square, it would be 18 by 18. So that's 18 times 18 for the whole square. But then we need to cut out this area in here. And this is the trickiest part of the problem is figuring out what are the dimensions of this area here. It's not x by x because the x is um, overlapping a little bit. Let's clear this away a little bit just so we can see what's going on. Okay, so we'd really like to know this length here, starting here to here, because this is the length of the square that we need to cut out. And we've got this guy up here, which we know is x, but he goes from here to here. And we know there's a one inch overlap. So this right here is one inch overlap. Over here we have a one inch overlap. So how could we express this area right here? Or this length right here? Well, it looks like it would be that x and then subtract off this one inch overlap and this one inch overlap. So x minus 1 and minus another one would be x minus 2. And that's what 
this length here is. And it's a square, so it's going to be the same for this length here. So out of that 18 inch square, we have to cut out a, another square that is x minus 2 squared. And that comes from this square is x minus 2 times x minus 2. That's the area of this square. And we're cutting that out of the 18 by 18 inch square because all we want is the area of the mat here. So um, make sure you're understanding where this is coming from and go, feel free to rewind and watch that again. But this is important. There's an example like this one in your um, web assign homework. But this is kind of the crux of the problem right here. Once we have this, um, it's pretty smooth sailing. I'm going to clean this up a little. This I know is a function whose input is x. So I'm going to call that a of x. And I also know that 18 squared is 324. So I can rewrite this as a of x equals 324 minus x minus 2 squared. I could multiply all of this out and kind of clean it up, but it's fine to, for this example to leave it like this. All they asked me to do was um, find what the area of the mat frame would be for an x by x inch picture, and I've done that here. And then we're asked the following follow-up question. If the picture, this picture in here, is 14 inch by 14 inch, what's the area of the mat frame? Okay, well, let's just use our formula. We know that x is representing the width of, and the, of the picture and the length of the picture. It's a square picture. So if we have a 14 inch by 14 inch picture, that means that x equals 14. We just need to throw it into this formula that we have for the area. So it would mean that we're looking for a of 14, and that is going to equal 324 minus, well, the x is now 14 minus 2 squared. And that's 324 minus, 14 minus 2 is 12, 12 squared, or 324 minus 144, which equals 180 square inches. And that's it. If the picture were 14 by 14, then the mat frame area will be 180 square inches. I want to make sure that you're using all of your resources on WebAssign. And when you scroll down, there's this um, little tab here that says resources. And if you click on that, these are all of the chapters in the textbook. So if you had uh, more questions or wanted to look at more examples, you would go to chapter four. And we're in section 4.3 right now. So we would go down, down, down. And 4.2, this is all of the material that we've been talking about. I really encourage you to, um, here it is, section 4.3, to um, look at some of the examples. Oh, here's an example right here, just like what we were talking about. Um, but there's also other ones. You're going to see a sheet pen example in your homework. And I think there's one in, in your textbook. Yeah, right here. So you're going to see one similar to this one. This is one that you might want to look over. Definitely be using the textbook if you have, um, you know, well, everybody should be using the textbook kind of to supplement what we're talking about on the videos. Some of the big ideas that we saw today were we introduced, we talked about what a vertex even is. It's the highest or lowest point of a quadratic function. And importantly, the rate of change at the vertex is always zero. Um, and then we spent a lot of time looking at the vertex form of a quadratic function. And this is just a different way of writing a quadratic function than standard form. And kind of, we went back and forth a little bit. We also in here talked about how to find the vertex from standard form. Um, we talked about horizontal intercepts and we looked at this application with this picture frame. There's a lot of great applications with quadratic functions. So you should expect to see a few of those in the homework.